Good day, everyone. Allow me to introduce our speaker for today. She is a professor and attending pediatrician at the University of the Philippines and the Philippine General Hospital. She is a fellow of the Philippine Pediatric Society, where she serves as a member of its Board of Trustees. She is also the immediate past president of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of the Philippines. She received her MD from the University of the Philippines. She completed her residency in pediatrics and a post-residency fellowship in pediatric infectious disease at UPPGH, where she is now chief of the Division of Infectious and Tropical Disease. As part of the Philippines' COVID-19 response effort, she serves as a member of the DOH Technical Advisory Group, the IATF Technical Working Group on COVID-19 Variants, as well as the Interim National Immunization Technical Advisory Group for COVID-19 Vaccines. Our speaker has published extensively on pediatric health and infectious disease and is heavily involved in clinical trials of pediatric vaccines, including those for missiles, mumps, and rubella, polio, pneumococcal disease, and influenza vaccines. She is also a regular speaker on topics relating to pediatrics, infectious disease, vaccines, and clinical trials in the Philippines and throughout Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome our speaker, Dr. Annalisa T. Ong Lim. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me start off by thanking the organizers for um, this invitation to speak to you today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with the team from um, Grace Christian. Well, I still think of it as Grace Christian High School. No, um, that was what it was called when I was still a student there many decades ago. And uh, it's a pleasure to be seeing um, uh, some of my old teachers who are here. Uh, I don't want to mention names because I might miss some of you, but uh, uh, it, it really is uh, so nice to see everybody here and uh, to have this opportunity to share information with you, um, particularly on this uh, very critical topic that uh, affects everybody. And uh, I think there's hardly any family that has been left untouched by COVID. And so for this afternoon, uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is really how we can um, empower ourselves, to empower our families, um, to be better protected against this disease. So I will just share my screen. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me start off by thanking the organizers for um, this invitation to speak to you today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with the team from um, Grace Christian. Well, I still think of it as Grace Christian High School. No, um, that was what it was called when I was still a student there many decades ago. And uh, it's a pleasure to be seeing um, uh, some of my old teachers who are here. Uh, I don't want to mention names because I might miss some of you, but uh, uh, it, it really is uh, so nice to see everybody here. And uh, to have this opportunity to share information with you, um, particularly on this uh, very critical topic that uh, affects everybody. And uh, I think there's hardly any family that has been left untouched by COVID. And so for this afternoon, uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is really how we can um, empower ourselves, to empower our families um, to be better protected against this disease. So this talk is what to do when COVID hits home, solutions for the current surge. So we do have a big problem right now. And what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is really just to talk about the current context before proceeding to uh, what we can do or what we should be doing. The WHO has a running tally of the number of cases that are being reported on a daily basis. And aside from this, they also report the number of deaths so far, as well as um, the number of vaccine doses that have been administered. Now, because the global population is so huge, no? expectedly, we have a lot of cases being reported, a lot of deaths. 
And personally, for me, uh, being an infectious disease um, specialist, the challenge has always been to try to keep these numbers real. You know? um, the conditions that we deal with are always numbered in the millions, in the hundreds of thousands. And it's very easy to just be numbed by the scope of this issue. And uh, for me, um, I try to make this relevant by um, relating it to something that I'm familiar with. And this is typically statistics um, pertaining to the Philippines. Now, we know that the current Philippine population numbers about 109 or 110 million. So when we talk about 137 million or so confirmed cases, that's kind of like saying every man, woman, child in the Philippines and more you know, have already been tested and have been confirmed positive for COVID-19. So that's a really huge number. Talking about um, 2.9 million deaths is uh, similar to saying that every single person who is a registered resident of Quezon City has already died from COVID. You know? So that just illustrates the magnitude of the impact of this disease. Looking at um, trends uh, of daily confirmed cases, we see that the green line representing the world, of course, um, has a um, huge number of reports. Um, and in comparison, Asia is about um, half the number. But the red line represents the Philippines, and we are about um, double the number that's being reported daily from Asia. These are the actual figures. No? Asia reports 48.2 cases per million population. Globally, the report is 77.1 cases per million population. And with the current surge, the Philippines has reported double that of Asia, 93.7 cases per million population. This is um, the figure coming from the, the, uh, the DOH COVID-19 tracker. We see that uh, as of April 15, or just three days ago, we already had 904,000 cases reported. Um, when I was doing these talks um, last year, you know, in March of last year, when the cases were starting to increase, the numbers had hardly reached 100,000. And in just 12 short months, uh, we are now almost 10 times the number. And if the rate of increase keeps up, in about eight or so days, we should be reaching our millions case. And I think that's a really significant no, number, uh, something that's quite sad to observe and a uh, wake up call for. Um, the authorities and the community in general to uh, improve you know, in terms of um, vigilance as well as um, interventions to control this disease. Out of the 900,000 cases, about a quarter or rather under a quarter are active currently. And of this total, we have 15,000 or so deaths. Now, in comparison to the figure that I showed earlier, the 2.9 million deaths, this seems to be quite a, I would say, respectable number, because given that our uh, country does not really have a lot of resources in terms of um, addressing critical care needs, the fact that we've been able to keep the numbers down to this level is um, really a credit to the healthcare system as well as healthcare workers. In comparison to the national data, we have uh, figures also focused on the national capital region where the surge is actually uh, playing out right now. Half of the total number of cases reported uh, nationally are coming from NCR, uh, with uh, again, half of the active cases coming from NCR as well. The total number of deaths number about a third, uh, or rather a third of the total deaths come from NCR. I think this is um, not difficult to understand because we um, typically have you know, more advanced care facilities in this region and um, it's possible to be able to provide uh, more critical care services uh, because, um, or rather, which accounts for most of the deaths in any case. 
this trend line shows us the story of how the pandemic has been playing out in our country. And I always like to include this so people get a perspective about what's happening. So we started off our um, recording in January and the numbers started going up actually uh, in the middle of the year, no? July, August. This was about that time when the healthcare sector um, uh, issued a public appeal for a time out. And uh, the idea here was not really to ask for an opportunity to rest, but really to regroup. You know, the concept was in a basketball game, if you're losing the game, how do you try to aim for a win if you still have a few minutes to go? And so the thinking at that time was there are system problems that need to be addressed so that we can, uh, uh, we can answer, you know, um, the need for uh, a better response uh, in the healthcare system. And uh, with that time out uh, was also uh, the imposition of a uh, ECQ, which led to a decrease in the number of people moving about in the community. This naturally led to a decrease in the number of cases being reported about two weeks after and um, eventually settled down such that by October of um, 2020, we had actually been able to reduce the reproduction number um, to about less than one per case of COVID reported. So I'll be explaining the concept of the reproduction number a little bit later as well. But maybe at this point, no, let me just say that um, we expect each case of COVID to actually generate two to three cases uh, as a result. No? So they, uh, it's quite contagious for every patient who's um, uh, defined as positive, you expect two to three other people eventually to get sick. So your goal is actually to decrease that reproduction number to less than one so that this is interpreted as a um, interference or uh, this is interpreted that as uh, the, the transmission has already been discontinued. So this actually was happening in October. Now, um, however, as we enter the Christmas season, unfortunately, this also brought about a, an increase in mobility. And this increase in mobility uh, was something that the healthcare sector once again called out and requested the public to be very wary about. No, this was about the time that people were being requested, please don't hold parties, please um, don't get together with your families, please uh, do online shopping rather than going to the malls, because we expect that with increased mobility, you would probably get an increase in the number of cases. So this is precisely what played out. Now, it's really very interesting. If you look at uh, Google mobility data and transpose your mobility from December 24 and the peak of cases in January, it was precisely that same period two weeks after that led to this um, increase in the number of cases. Now, we were hoping that this would be quickly contained and it uh, decreased quite rapidly, but unexpectedly, there was this um, um, gradual, uh, later exponential increase that leads us to the current surge. About February 15, uh, um, following a long period where our number of cases was actually decreased. Um, we had um, cases being reported initially 2,000, later on uh, becoming uh, 4,000, 8,000. And uh, currently every day we're reporting about 10,000 cases. That's why uh, earlier on in this talk, I mentioned that maybe in about um, seven or eight days, we should be expecting to see a million cases being registered already. This table shows us the leading contributors for the different um, uh, provinces, regions, and cities. This top part of the graph has actually not really changed over time. Um, the leading contributors have always been NCR and its contiguous regions, Region 3 and Region 4A. And uh, for the Visayas and Mindanao region, it is also the hub no? um, that receives the most travelers, that uh, reports the most number of cases as well. Um, what is new, though, is that we are already registering increasing number of cases also from new entrants into this list. So, for example, Cagayan Valley used to be number five or was not in the list at all no, in the past few months, uh, started to appear as number five 
at about the same time that the variants were also being detected and eventually is now inching its way up um, to the leaderboard. In terms of provinces and cities, again, these are the usual um, leaders, but now we have new entrants. A couple of weeks ago, it was Pasay, now it's Bulacan. No? So again, um, perhaps related to the detection of the variants in these areas uh, that are reporting their cases. Um, I showed this part of, or the top part of the this slide earlier, um, showing you the number of cases as well as the number of deaths from NCR. But now I'd like you to focus on the number of active cases. So if we have 91,000 cases, we don't expect each case to require hospital or facility-based care. Actually, we expect that the majority of these 91,000 cases will be mild. About 98% are expected to be mild. 1% will be expected to present as asymptomatic cases, while those who are moderate, severe, or critical, a number about 1.3%. This is uh, based on uh, observations of the local data. In the literature, what's been reported is 80% um, mild and asymptomatic, with 15% moderate and severe critical, numbering about 5% of the total population. So those are the, um, that's the range you know, over which we try to project our hospital, um, rather our healthcare utilization capacity um, with the low numbers being projected coming from the local observations and the high numbers being the ones cited in the literature. But if we utilize these actual numbers that we have in the Philippines, what we expect is that the majority, about 90,000 or so, should actually not need uh, hospital-based or facility-based care. And we only need about 1,200 beds, um, um, well, a minimum of 1,200 beds to be able to fulfill our um, national, or rather our requirements for NCR. Now, if that was the case, then why is it that we're having such a difficulty um, ensuring that people have um, hospital rooms to be admitted into if they're really sick. You know? So let's look at um, this part of the tracker and understand the data better. In the NCR, there are 159 facilities. And if you look at utilization or the occupancy, that's 67.4%. So that means you have about 30 or so percent still available for admission, which is a respectable number. The problem is... Um, the majority of facilities that are able to provide critical care are actually, actually already classified as moderate, high risk, or critical risk in terms of occupancy. You have facilities, about 60 facilities, um, which are tagged safe, but these are typically um, the ones that are also smaller, less well-known, probably not staffed, by um, specialists and so are typically considered second tier and are not uh, top of mind for people who wish to be admitted for critical care. Another thing we need to remember is that out of that 1,000 or so people who will need um, uh, hospital or critical care facilities because they are classified as moderate, severe, or critical illness, um, they don't actually just stay for one, two, or three days. No, they need to be admitted to the hospital, typically for about three weeks or so before they either improve or they pass away. So a person who is admitted to a critical care bed will be needing that facility for quite some time. And if you imagine that for every day that passes, you have 1,200, 1,200, 1,200 being added to the number, then it's very easy to see why our system is already overwhelmed when we only have about um, roughly 13,000 or so, rather 10,000 or so beds um, um, available no, for the NCR. So basically, if we were to go by the numbers, you basically have a buffer of about four or five days worth. Uh, before the, oh, the healthcare capacity is already overwhelmed. So um, with that, it's very easy to see that home care is something that needs to be an option uh, because of um, 
the inavailability of um, facilities for inpatient care. And also, equally importantly, because home care is really a um, feasible option you know, for mild or asymptomatic cases of COVID-19 for as long as um, that person has no um, comorbidities or no risk factors. So I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. So when we go to um, decision-making, no, um, actually, we need to look at three factors. First, whether um, we need to look at the clinical evaluation of um, the patient. Next, we need to look at the evaluation of the home setting. And finally, we need to look at the, cap the capabilities of the caregivers to provide care in the home setting. So I'd like to um, translate these factors into the three key questions that we will be answering for the rest of this talk. First, we want to answer whether the patient qualifies for home care. Second, we want to see whether the home setup is appropriate. And finally, we want to check whether caregivers can adequately assess the patient. So let's look at the first question. And basically, we need to be able to select the ideal patient for home care so that the outcome will be uh, optimized. So we want to identify those who are asymptomatic or with mild disease or with moderate disease but without risk factors. Okay, so how do we define mild um, disease or moderate disease without risk factors? We basically need to see that the patient is breathing at a rate of less than 30 per minute without any difficulty or without any evidence of shortness of breath. So how do you identify somebody who is short of breath? They should be able to move comfortably without any labored breathing. When they speak, they should be able to speak in sentences comfortably. No? They should be able to carry out or carry on a conversation with you that makes sense so that uh, we know that their oxygenation level corresponds to at least 94% on room air. So um, these features need to be present in the patient that we are selecting for um, home care should they be positive for COVID-19. Now, we also talked about selecting those with moderate disease without risk factors. No? So what risk factors are we actually thinking about? First, they cannot be, um, well, they, they should be preferably less than 60 years because age in itself is already a risk factor for poor outcome. Um, comorbidities like um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, lung disease, chronic kidney disease, immunosuppression, and cancer are also red flags that should um, indicate risk for progression and should um, trigger you know, a preference for facility-based care. People who have a um, prolonged smoking history or who are obese are also at risk for developing the more severe forms of COVID and therefore they should also be um, prioritized for facility care. Now, the additional requirements that need to be fulfilled in the home setting include its capacity to implement appropriate infection um, prevention and control uh, measures, and also the capability for close monitoring by a trained healthcare worker. So now we're ready to look at the question of, is the home setup appropriate? Now, before we go into that, we have to think about the objectives of providing home care. Of course, what is top of mind for the family is usually uh, being able to make sure that the person who is sick uh, receives uh, medications and the supportive care that is important to make sure that he's, he's comfortable at the time of the illness and also will eventually recover. But an equally important measure that needs to be answered by home care is the capacity to isolate and quarantine. So it's very important to understand the difference between the two so we understand the purpose and also why the duration is set at those um, number of days. So people who are sick or who are um, asymptomatic but are positive for COVID-19 undergo isolation. And the goal of isolation is actually 
to be able to ensure that the person who is positive no longer transmits the disease to other people. Now, that means we need to define the period over which the person is contagious. So, hanggang kailan ba nakakahawa ang isang tao? Somebody who is positive, whether he is symptomatic or asymptomatic, is typically known to be contagious for about 10 days. And that is why the period of isolation is actually shorter than the period of quarantine. We're actually just trying to um, define the period over which we want this person to be out of circulation so they don't spread the disease further. So somebody who is positive, asymptomatic, is no longer considered contagious after 10 days from the onset or the positive test. Somebody who is um, sick and positive needs to fill or fulfill a 10-day isolation with an additional three days without um, symptoms before they can release from um, this restriction. Now, in contrast, those who are quarantined are actually um, being observed no, for symptoms to develop. These are people who are not yet positive, who are not yet symptomatic, but are close contacts of people who have been identified as COVID-19 positive. So maybe I should also talk about how do we define close contacts. No? These are people that, you've, that the positive case has spent time with for at least 15 minutes without a mask in close proximity with, uh, in an enclosed setting. So definitely everybody in the household is considered a close contact. Now we quarantine these people so that they are, are, can be observed over a 14-day period for the development of symptoms. We already restrict their movements because we cannot um, risk the possibility that as they go out, they may already be infecting people because people are contagious two days before the onset of symptoms. So uh, being in a high-risk uh, category for developing this disease, we already want to restrain their movements so that even if they develop symptoms, they will not have already infected other people. So this is a 14-day period that prevents the spread of infection or contamination and allows for early monitoring or rather for monitoring of symptoms for early detection. Now, um, because we are uh, very concerned about making sure that the person who is positive no longer spreads the disease, the isolation facilities need to be prepared uh, uh, adequately. So we assign a, a ro separate room with a separate bathroom for the person who is positive. We ensure that this room has good airflow and um, with a door that can be kept closed to restrict the movements of that person and the entry of other people in the home. And likewise, also for unidirectional airflow. And finally, you need to be able to set up a delivery system that um, uh, provides for safe um, provision or delivery of uh, the isolated person's daily needs. Now, ideally, the person who is isolated should not need any or much care from people in the home. Um, this should be somebody who is fairly healthy, is able to take care of himself or herself, and just probably will need to be provided with food, um, water, maybe their medications, very minimal supervision from the rest of the household. So actually, if you were to think about it, there should be very little need for a complicated set of personal protective equipment to be available in the home to set up a home care system. If it's necessary for somebody who is quarantined to provide um, for the person's need, for the, isolation, uh, for the isolated person's needs, typically you will only need a face mask and a face shield because the contact should be very quick, no? You probably just need to hand something over or you can just leave whatever it is outside the door. And uh, if there's a need to assist, then um, this should be enough basic equipment. If you have gloves, that will be helpful. You don't even need to have a jumpsuit or surgical gown, but if that's available, then that's fine. No, My point is it shouldn't, the, the, 
lack of the overalls or the lack of a gown or jumpsuit should not stop us from considering setting up home care for our relatives because basically your selection of the patient um, should ensure that there should be minimum contact yet the person will be okay with just um, um, this particular setup. Now, um, there, there are um, lots of advice no, or specific advice for caregivers uh, providing care at home. And this will include um, a reminder to limit the patient's movements around the house and to minimize shared space. Second, household members should avoid entering the room. And in settings where there really are a lot of people and lots of shared spaces, there may be instances where you actually don't have separate rooms, then WHO recognizes this as a uh, um, possible setup no, in many countries. And they say if it's not possible for um, that to happen, then you have to keep at least one meter distance from the patient. It's also important to make sure that visitors are not allowed, or rather we, we limit the number of caregivers and the caregiver assigned should be somebody who is not elderly and also isn't sick no? because of course you don't want to um, increase the number of positive cases in your household. We don't allow visitors. Of course, the person who will provide care should um, always be very conscious about hand hygiene because this is the main portal through which we might be able to infect ourselves uh, with the disease. The patient should be given a medical mask worn as much as possible and changed daily or whenever wet or dirty from secretions. And um, if the materials used to cover the mouth and nose are um, reusable, no? because in some settings there's a shortage of medical masks, then you need to be able to discard that or clean it appropriately after use. Caregivers should also cover or wear a medical mask, which should not be touched or handled and which should be discarded after contact with the patient. We avoid direct contact with the patient's body fluids so this include the respiratory secretions, the stool, and if it's necessary to provide some kind of care for the sick person, then you want to be able to um, use disposable gloves as well to protect yourself from infection. Um, these single use masks and gloves need to be disposed of um, after use. But if you are um, cleaning surfaces or handling clothing or linen soiled with body fluids, then plastic aprons or utility gloves can actually be used. But they have to be cleaned and disinfected afterwards. Your surfaces that are frequently touched in the room where the patient is being cared for should be cleaned and disinfected at least once daily. You can use regular soap and water. Or you can also use um, a household disinfectant like um, sodium hypochlorite or a bleach solution. The sick person needs to use dedicated towels, bed sheets, linens, and eating utensils. And if I might suggest, now that person should also be provided with cleaning implements like maybe a sponge, some detergent, dishwashing liquid, no? So that when he or she finishes the meal, then you base, that person can send out a clean set of utensils that the, per, that the rest of the household does not have to deal with disinfecting anymore. Um, linens, clothing, um, and other um, reusable you know, gowns, gloves uh, can be laundered with regular soap and water. Uh, if you're using a machine, the recommendation is to use warm water with common household detergent. For the reusable items, you may want to use a bleach solution to disinfect. Now, your option is actually to wash all of these um, uh, clothing, linens, towels right away. Or if you want to put them in a laundry bag, then you may opt to leave it for several days before handling so that whatever may have been. Um, may have contaminated 
those uh, clothing or those cloth items will have dried up and will have less of a chance to uh, infect the person who's in charge of washing. The recommendation though is not to wash so as not to aerosolize these virus particles. Waste generated at home while caring for a COVID-19 patient should also be um, packed in um, yellow bags not to indicate that these are um, contagious or infectious waste and can be handled appropriately by the um, garbage disposal services. And uh, we advise also the caregivers to avoid uh, exposure to contaminated items from the patient's immediate environment like um, toothbrushes, cigarettes, towels, and so forth. Okay. So with that in mind, then we know that, um, or rather with that in mind, then um, it makes sense no, for these items to be found or to be present in the home for um, as part of the regular supply. No? So you want to have PPEs, um, and, and this doesn't really refer to the um, overalls or the um, surgical gowns, but rather face mask, face shield, gloves, because these are the more important items that you expect to need no, as you take care of the patient. You also need a lot of cleaning and disinfection supplies. Now, um, uh, of course, I mentioned already soap and water. You also need to have a supply of alcohol in the home. And bleach is actually very useful. Now, um, the local brand of bleach um, does not actually indicate uh, its concentration per volume. I've been looking at the label. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the information there. So we're using their recommended dilution at 45 milliliters per liter of water. If you look at references, they will say one part per 49, one part bleach per 49 uh, parts of water. So I guess basically the message is you, whatever bleach you're using, just look at the label for the manufacturer's instructions for the, for the recommended um, dilution. Um, and then the other thing you want to remember is that you prepare enough for the day's use because it does evaporate and the concentration can change. So you want freshly prepared solution to maximize its um, disinfecting effect. Um, monitoring supplies are important. So we want to be able to establish a record of the patient's signs and symptoms so that when we communicate with the healthcare worker who is supervising our home care, we are speaking the same language. So you want to prepare, for example, a record that shows um, um, the date, the time, um, the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the temperature, and if the patient is already being monitored previously for hypertension, you also want to include the blood pressure as part of your recording as well. Now, if you have a pulse oximeter, it might be helpful to also look at the oxygen saturation um, level for that patient, which I mentioned earlier should be at least 94 on room air without any kind of oxygen supplementation. So how frequently are you expected to monitor the patient's vital signs? Typically, you know, the WHO will say, if this is a mild case, once a day should be fine. Maybe if you're moderate and you want to do this more frequently. In the hospital setting, the minimum is about eight, uh, every eight hours, so three times a day. So you can play with that range, maybe coordinate with your healthcare provider as to what their preference is, so that when you relay this information, you have a common baseline against which to, um, on, on which to start your discussions from. You also want to be able to have, in, have at hand medications that the patient will need, like fever, cough, and cold medicines, because these are the primary um, um, symptoms that you want to address as well as a supply of the patient's regular medication. So you can continue this or administering these drugs. Now, finally, we go to that last question of, um, can the caregivers assess the patient appropriately? Um, one of the important aspects of making the decision to proceed with home care is to see whether the patient can be adequately monitored at home. And um, 
ideally, health worker should be the one providing this care. No? So kung meron sanang makukuhang home care nurse or caregiver or midwife who can provide this care, that would be the best set up because you know that they are trained to observe and they can communicate efficiently with the healthcare worker. Pero alam din natin sa ngayon that there's a shortage of trained health professionals. And so what usually will happen is somebody from the home or the family will be the one establishing contact with the healthcare worker or the healthcare professional by phone. And they will be the ones communicating about the signs and symptoms and observations. So not only do you have to have that capacity in the absence of a healthcare worker, but you also need to be able to have lines of communication open so that um, this exchange of information can take place. Now, what are we supposed to be watching out for? You basically want to monitor your symptoms regularly and watch out for worsening of the symptoms. So what are you looking for? Anything that might indicate a decrease in the oxygen level of the patient. So this will include um, lightheadedness, difficulty breathing, chest pain, dehydration, which are indications to seek urgent care. So to expand on that, um, um, uh, those signs and symptoms, we see here that um, emergency warning signs of COVID include difficulty of breathing, which can also take the form of pain or pressure in the chest, um, signs of decreased oxygen level in the brain, presenting as being confused or disoriented, or an inability to stay awake or to be woken up. Of course, the color is very important. If you observe the patient to be pale or grayish or with blue-tinged lips, then of course, um, you know that those are um, signs that will warrant emergency medical care. So um, in this section, we said it's important that we establish a single caregiver with the capacity to be able to monitor, but it's equally important for that caregiver to establish contact with a healthcare professional because that healthcare pro professional will be providing the guidance um, regarding day-to-day -day activities and also the trigger for transferring to facility-based care. Now, there are um, hotlines no, established by each of our local government units, and these are listed here. So as soon as somebody in your home is identified as being COVID positive, I would urge you to get in touch with the BHERTS or the Barangay Health Emergency Response Team. They are uh, assigned for each barangay, and uh, they are actually trained no, to, to um, pick up some of the early symptoms, as well as to facilitate um, transfer to either a TTMF or a hospital no, within the locality. And should they not be able to find placement for you, they should also have the capacity to contact the One COVID Referral Command or One COVID Referral Network, which should be able to provide referral to other hospital facilities that may still have vacancies um, to accommodate somebody with a worsening medical condition. So aside from um, the local government units, many um, private hospitals have already set up um, telemedicine services uh, for supervision of individuals who may be COVID positive, but who can still be cared for in the home. So here I just put two examples. All of the major hospitals already have this. And if I may mention, in addition, PGH has also started its um, Bayanihan um, COVID referral se uh, service. No? So you contact uh, this team through the 155-200 that we've used since the start of the pandemic and just say that you are um, consulting for COVID home care. So you will be patched through um, volunteer uh, physicians who are manning the lines and who will be able to provide um, advice no? and uh, monitoring depending on the severity of the case being referred. So when do you expect for this home care setup to need to continue? Recovery is actually expected in about um, 7 to 10 days. So you will see in this blue part of the 
graph that mild to moderate illness is expected to last about 10 days. But if at about midway point, day five, day six, the patient starts to show progression of symptoms, then you may expect that that person will be progressing to severe or critical illness. And of course, this will require facility-based care. So I hope uh, with this uh, talk, I've been able to share with you um, the fact that the current surge in cases has already severely challenged our healthcare capacity. But since the majority of COVID cases are expected to be mild, then home care can be an option for individuals who are mild or with moderate disease, but without risk factors. So typically they are low risk individuals. What we need to see is whether the patient has risk factors for progression, whether the home environment has the capacity to implement home care, and whether caregivers have the capacity or have the ability to assess the patient's status. And if each of these systems is a goal, then you may be able to help your family and help your um, loved ones through this crisis uh, with flying colors. So uh, with that, let me end this presentation and turn the floor over back to our moderator for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctora. Wow, that was a wealth of information. Thank you for enlightening us. I'm sure as we as we were listening, we have some questions in mind. We shall now open the floor for questions. You may send in your questions through the chat box here at Zoom. If you're here with us or through the text messages uh, that you can send to, to our uh, phone number, 0916-302-6499. Now we have the we have the first question here. As we are already into the second year of this pandemic, what makes COVID nineteen different from or similar with other known pandemics in the past, Dora? The pandemic that is usually referenced uh, in relation to COVID uh, has been the Spanish flu out. Uh, the Spanish flu epidemic that was reported in the early um, 1900s. No? And it actually took several years before um, control mm -hmm. for that disease was eventually achieved. Um, the Spanish flu um, outbreak actually was said to have killed more people than World War I. No? So if you imagine the extent of... Um, the impact of that disease. It's kind of like repeating itself now, the Because we've already mentioned that we've had almost 3 million deaths, 100 and million, 130 million cases, and, and that's a really huge number to be dealing with. Thank you for that. There's another question here. If one is asymptomatic, is a 14-day quarantine enough? And while the patient is asymptomatic, up to what extent can he or she transmit? Okay, so um, I'd like to mention once again that when we say somebody is asymptomatic, so detected to be positive na yan, di ba? Kaya natin nasabing asymptomatic. Ang ginagawa natin is not quarantine, but isolation, di ba? So we want to be, tech we want to, use the correct term so we understand what we're trying to achieve. You want to isolate because you are after prevention of the spread of the disease to other people. Now, how do we know that 10 days is enough? I guess that's the question, diba? Um, You know, um, if you test somebody now and you do the test daily, they can be positive for up to 90 days from the time that they were first tested. So recognizing that um, tests can remain positive without necessarily indicating that somebody is contagious, we have already moved away from a test-based strategy to clear somebody or release them from isolation to what is called a time-based strategy. This is meaning that on the 10th day, for asymptomatic individuals, we consider them no longer to be contagious and allow them to resume their normal activities. Now, what is that 10-day interval based on? 
Research has shown that if you take a swab from that infected person on day 1, day 5, day 7, day 10, day 15, they only produce viable virus up to day 10. Beyond that, they no longer, uh, the, the isolates coming from them are no longer uh, reproducing and are no longer um, infecting other people. So that means that within this uh, um, period, no, within 10 days, we consider them infectious. After that, they're no longer infectious. They are allowed to, to leave isolation. Thank you. We have here, because our government has been very uh, active into you know, asking people to go into vaccination. Uh, Per DOH, one can get vaccinated right after fully recovering from COVID. However, other doctors would say that it's only after 90 days. Why is there any a conflict between these ideas? Which is the correct timetable for that? The 90 days was the initial recommendation. And this has already been superseded as of March 5, also by CDC. So these um, recommendations actually change very, very quickly. So that 90-day recommendation is no longer current. The new recommendation, which uh, coming from CDC, which uh, our DOH, uh, National uh, Immunization Technical Advisory Group, has also adopted, no, is um, to provide vaccines for uh, positive cases, uh, as soon as they recover from illness or, um, on, or on or beyond the 14th day if we're dealing with an asymptomatic individual. The 90 days has already been revised. Okay, here's a question. Um, you mentioned about uh, not washing the linens of COVID positive person and not shaking so that it will, you know, can you give some clarification? And also there's another question similar to this, is that uh, how long does a COVID-19 virus uh, survive on surfaces like clothes, shoes, or even deliveries, papers? The virus actually requires um, immediate transmission to continue to be viable it doesn't stay very long on surfaces. Um, even as uh, we've heard no, um, a lot of material being shared about um, um, the virus being uh, found on surfaces after several days or uh, hours no, uh, after they've been deposited onto those surfaces. In actuality, a very specific set of circumstances has to happen for viruses to stay for a long time on surfaces. So generally, the way the transmission happens is from one person who's infected to um, uh, share their droplets to somebody who is um, nearby, um, within a meter's distance, who is not protected so that the virus gains entry into the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and infects the person. So, does the virus get deposited on surfaces? Siyempre, pwede pa rin mangyari, di ba? Uh, if you have, for example, uh, a laptop right beside you and somebody right behind that, no, then you expect that keyboard, of course, and the screen to be infected because it's very near. But those droplets will not move to you unless you touch the surface, rub your eyes or your nose or your mouth. So, your hands are still going to be the transmitters of these viruses. So even as we warn people no, to um, make sure that the surfaces are clean and so on and so forth, the critical thing actually is to make sure that this is covered, that you're washing your hands, and that we do away with the habit of touching our mouth, our face, our nose, our eyes um, with hands that have not been washed, no, especially if we've been handling other objects. So um, we don't typically have to be very obsessive compulsive about um, objects or items that we receive uh, into our home or that we even buy from the grocery. 
um, one example I usually state is, you know, if that was the case, then everybody who delivers objects and everybody in the grocery store who handles the stocks, dapat nagkasakit na sila lahat ng COVID, di ba? Wala naman tayo nababalita ang gano'n na lahat ng grab driver suddenly nagkaroon ng COVID o lahat ng lalamove o lahat ng whatever delivery service pa ay nagkaroon na ng COVID kasi ang dami nilang hinahatid sundo, di ba? So hindi nang gagaling sa objects. It's really more person-to-person transmission. Now, ano naman yung nabanggit ko about laundry? We're talking about somebody who is sick using the clothing, the linens, the towels. Siyempre, may secretions yan nung may sakit. No? So pwede mo namang labahan ka agad, wala namang problema. Pero kung di naman niya kailangan ka agad, if you leave it to dry for a couple of days, then you as the handler can have an extra dose of reassurance na pag nilalabhan mo yan, kahit na hindi ka na nga mag okay lang. No? Um, kasi tuyo na siya, hindi na madaling um, mag-aerosolize yung particles. So, di ba typically bago tayo maglaba, minsan gusto natin sineshake para matanggal yung mga dumi. Yun lang yun. No? Since sinasabi, wag mong gagawin yan kasi pag nag-shake ka, di nag-aerosolize yung mga gamit, eh di pag huminga ka, di may nalanghap ka rin. So, uh, that's the precaution there. Thank you, Doctor. And here is a follow-up to that. Is COVID-19 airborne once and for all? <laughs> According to our audience. <laughs> the current thinking is that the main route of transmission is droplet. Airborne transmission is a possibility because um, um, there are patterns of transmission that cannot be explained by um, just droplet modes alone. Beron kasing mga instances where the individuals who were infected were quite distance, distant from the index case. And uh, it was thought that the um, circulation in the air uh, might have accounted for transmission in those instances. So right now, the thinking is it's probably a combination, but the main mode is still um, droplet. Thank you. Now, um, how would the, you know, if it is a seasonal flu or COVID-19, since COVID-19 is, is uh, so widespread, so uh, like if a person gets headache, cough, and sore throat, the period of the third day, then tested negative, on the fifth day, is it safe to say that it's just the seasonal flu and not the COVID-19? Okay, so siguro nung nagsimula, um, that would have been part of the advice. No? Parang the challenge is to differentiate between similar illnesses like COVID or flu or maybe even allergies or common cough and cold illness. Um, kaso ngayon, with the a uh, very high prevalence of COVID and the fact that we're actually spreading it so quickly uh, within workplaces and in the homes, the mindset should change. No? You should assume it's COVID until proven otherwise. Why? Because the problem nga is the transmission is affecting not just um, the individual no? but the entire household. And to be able to contain this disease efficiently, the mindset or parang our SOP should be anybody who starts feeling any symptom, cough, cold, sore throat, fever, um, body malay, parang a little bit of body soreness, fever, diarrhea, isolate immediately. And then um, after you isolate, you figure out a way to get yourself tested. Now, the people in your home should quarantine. Once the test results come out, the decision is going to be made whether you can be released from isolation and everybody else can be released from quarantine. Kasi negative. Pero kung positive yan, tuloy yung isolation mo, tuloy yung quarantine ng mga tao sa bahay. Kahit na hindi mo na sila itest, okay lang. Kasi hindi pa rin naman matatanggal sa quarantine kahit negative yung test ng mga kasama mo sa bahay. You continue to have to be in quarantine because those negative test results for your household members might be false negatives. 
it might have just been done too early. You know, the tests might just have been done too early and therefore um, they're not actually reflective of um, an incubating illness. You know? So um, by this SOP, you know, using this process, then we are able to um, contribute towards containing disease spread. Kasi kung ang mindset natin, oh, I think I'll observe this first, whether this is, um, uh, for example, uh, cough and cold illness or flu, then those few days that you continue to observe can actually be also those few days that you continue spreading the disease around because of course you don't isolate naman if it's just common cough and colds diba? you continue doing your regular thing no? mm -hmm. so what we want to do now is really contribute towards containing the spread because there really is just just so many people who are sick okay uh, speaking of isolation how do we isolate a seven-year-old who is asymptomatic since at this age they are very dependent and usually they would be sleeping with their parents. And how all and how can their emotions also be handled? Should the child be informed? Okay, so um, that's actually a big problem now, no? Because again, uh, many clusters are being reported in the households. So what we want to do is um, also consider the possibility that kids uh, who are young kids rather who are um, still very attached or um, um, interact very closely with their parents um, we should consider them uh, as potentially positive once the parents have been identified as positive even if they don't have symptoms even if they don't test no because you have the option actually to test or not eh? Um, and, and I have to say that um, at this point, eh, this is probably just a matter of documentation na lang. Hindi na important kasi hindi, wala ka namang gagawing iba eh. Mag-positive or mag-negative yung bata, ganun pa rin. You will still isolate um, the individual or you will still quarantine. No? So it doesn't affect the way you manage. Um, uh, you will still prevent this person from going out and interacting with other people. And if there should be symptoms, then you have to assume that the patient is already or the child is already positive. Now, should you inform them? Um, ako generally, kasi I'm an advocate of always letting the patient know what they have so that they will cooperate. If you explain it to them, then they have an understanding of what's happening. And therefore, um, they're more motivated. No? For example, if you want them to increase their fluid intake, if you tell them, you know, kasi um, uh, mommy and daddy are also sick with COVID and I think you also, you might also be sick and therefore one of the things we need to keep doing is to make sure we're well, we are all well hydrated, then uh, it gives the child also a reason. So you, you um, provide information at a level that the child can understand. You know? And the goal is actually for them to be uh, cooperative you know, with the kind of care that you're providing. Indeed, it's very challenging you know, to tell these children because at the same time, we are also emotional when your oh, yes. kids at that age will get COVID. That's true. In your talk, you mentioned that no these people are candidates for home care. But how about if these people are, well, they don't have much illnesses and yet they are already above 65 or above 75? Uh, are they supposed to go to the hospital immediately or they can also be taken care at home? Um, so that's the, ano, that's now the, how would you put this? The, added value that is provided by, um, early consultation with a healthcare provider, no? So, syempre, um, bilang family member, you don't expect naman to be knowledgeable about um, health concerns, no? Being a lay person. So, yung healthcare provider ngayon ang mag assess ng risk factors ng elderly individual na yan para sabihin sa iyo, ito sa tingin ko pwede sa bahay or sa tingin ko kailangan nyo nang pumunta sa ospital. So, um, the response, no, of course, will not be uniform for each person, but what should be the SOP is even if you decide for home care, dapat merong kayong kausap na healthcare provider. Thank you. 
uh, how if how do we know if a COVID patient is not infectious and or anymore? Of course, we have the, you mentioned about how long, but what if after completing the fourteen day isolation, and then uh, he, he again tested positive. With, without any symptoms anymore and yet tested positive. Um, sorry, she, but it tested positive when? After completion after, of home care? Yeah, yes. After 14 days quarantine. Ah, okay, okay. So supposedly quarantine period is done already and yet tested positive. What should he or she do? So ito na nga yung nabanggit ko kanina, di ba? Pwede ka nga maging positive for 90 days after the initial test. Uh, even if it's just... Uh, Whether just you're a... symptomatic or asymptomatic. So the test, no, the PCR, sige, so siguro let me start from there para mas maintindihan yung concept. The PCR kasi no, is a test that detects the genetic material of the virus it's very good at picking up even tiny, tiny portions of this genetic material. Now, um, having uh, that capability also means that um, it can continue to pick up residual virus, which can continue to be present in the person's body for about 90 days from the time that they test positive, whether that is symptomatic or asymptomatic disease. So that's why the recommendation is we no longer depend on a negative test before we decide that a person should stop being isolated. By the time umabot na ng 10 days for the asymptomatic, or 10 days plus 3 asymptomatic days for the symptomatic individual, sinasabi natin na pwede na silang magtapos ng isolation. Kasi base sa mga studies, kahit mag-test ka on day 15, day 20, day 30, day 40, day 50, nandyan pa rin yung virus, pwede pa rin siyang ma-pick up nung PCR. Pero hindi ibig sabihin na nakakahawa ka pa. So wala ng point na mag-extend, nang mag-extend, nang mag-extend. Uh, for ano for isolation kasi hindi ka na nakakahawa di ba sabi natin ano ba yung purpose ng isolation para hindi ka manghawa eh kung hindi ka na nakakahawa bakit ka kailangan ni isolate di ba yeah, uh, there is this question when a person goes to the hospital for a swab testing uh, when well could be already exposed to some covid positive patients does that mean after going to the hospital for a swab test then since exposed already, do they have to quarantine themselves? Okay. So exposure um, should also be defined according to risk. Hindi naman lahat ng exposure magre-result sa infection. Kung... Um, we are able to convert that exposure into a low-risk encounter. Kaya ang recommendation parati sa atin is apat dapat. Remember, you uh, try to manage uh, being in an area with good air circulation or ventilation. You uh, make sure that your physical distancing is observed. You always wear your mask and your shield properly. And you manage the time of exposure to ideally no, less than 15 minutes or less than 30 minutes or the shortest possible time. Now, if the exposure is low risk based on those categories, then there's no point in quarantining. Diba? Hindi na naman to isolation. You are quarantining because if you want to be quarantined and you follow the logic here, 14 days kang hindi lalabas. If you're ready to do that, then that's fine. But if it's a low-risk exposure, then there's really no point. So to be able to avoid the inconvenience of a 14-day quarantine, the recommendation is you make sure that your exposure is always low-risk by implementing all of those parameters to as much as you can. So may karugtong yung apat-dapat na yan. Apat-dapat, tatlo sapat. No? Meaning if you can get 75% of all of that, no? at least uh, three of the four parameters, then um, you can still be considered as a low-risk exposure. Pero um, typically, hindi pwedeng mawala yung mask and shield. Eh, no? Kasi yung talaga yung kailangan mong proteksyonan. 
So um, basically, the point is um, uh, convert the encounter to a low-risk exposure so there's no need to be quarantined even when exposed. There is a very specific question here about his bro a brother's condition, though the, the age was not specified here. COVID survivor last April 5, undergoing dialysis, taking medicine. The question is that why is he feeling numbness in, uh, in, his, in his feet? You said there's an underlying diabetes. Did I hear it correctly? Dialysis. Undergoing oh, dialysis. Okay. Well, that's very hard to assess. No? Parang I would need to get a detailed history, maybe try to get some physical examination um, details uh, to make an assessment. So I would suggest for this a person to actually consult, no, right online with their physician to be adequately evaluated. Okay. Um, there, uh, can you explain more about long-term uh, effect of those who contracted COVID already? Because many of those who survive, uh, they still experience like sometimes shortness of breath, and of course they get alarmed. And the next question to that is that a, a, a person after recovering from COVID, is it still possible for him to contract the disease a second time? So let me answer the second part of the question first. No, The, the reason why we advise uh, people who have been positive to be vaccinated is because they are also, um, they can also still be uh, uh, infected you know, with a second bout of COVID. So that answers that second part of the question. Pwede pa ulit mahawaan. Um, tapos, the question about uh, long term symptoms, why do they develop? You know? um, the virus primarily affects. Um, the respiratory tract and um, as it infects our respiratory system, our immune system um, creates a defense that in the process can uh, cause permanent damage to the architecture of the lung or long-term damage to the architecture of the lung. When that happens, that can lead to um, development of episodes of shortness of breath, uh, which can take some time to uh, resolve. Also, when you have shortness of breath, that doesn't necessarily just indicate that the lungs are affected. It can also be the heart. And uh, it is known that COVID can also have, uh, the, the immune response to COVID can also damage other organs, including the heart. Uh, and this can be uh, part of the symptom uh, presenting for this category of patients. Thank you. Um, th th this is, uh, there's this question that when, when the neighbor, the whole family, the neighbor got tested positive for COVID-19, does it mean that they also have to undergo swab tests just to be sure? Well, that will depend on whether they have interactions with the neighbor, no? Mm -hmm. So if this is somebody that they don't talk to, they don't interact with, none of their household members interact with this neighbor, then there is no exposure, diba? So ang trigger naman natin for doing testing is always, have you been exposed? And has this exposure been uh, uh, of the high risk um, nature or category. Sabi nga natin kanina, di ba, pagka low risk yung exposure, hindi kailangan ng testing. So kung walang exposure, mas lalong hindi kailangan ng testing, di ba? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, there are still some questions, but all of these are um, for vaccines. And as Dr. Christine mentioned, we might have another session for that. So we will yes. just... So, so let me apologize, ha, Ma'am Patty, kasi, you know, um, the problem with that is 
uh, to be able to answer these questions properly, we have to also have the context to understand. Otherwise, it will just be yes, no, yes, no. That's all I can say because to explain, it will take some time and I don't think anybody's interested to stay until 6 o'clock. Mm, fully understood. Thank you, Dr. for your understanding also because people are all excited, you know, because yes. everybody seems to be getting vaccinated. So they have a lot of questions. We will reserve all of this for, for our next session, perhaps. Before we end this, uh, uh, this part of our program, Dr. would you like to share some more last words or uh, the advice of uh, especially on the care of our family members and especially the maybe the psychological aspects of it because being at home for a year already is uh, sometimes depressing enough for some people and then somebody in the family would get COVID, especially the, the younger ones. And we have had families, we have heard of families. Both parents are exposed, both, parent, both parents are, are COVID positive so that the whole family, they don't know what to do. Even the children, even their schooling are affected. So what would be a good advice or preparation aside from all those that have been mentioned already? Um, I think no, our mindset should be defensive. Even now, uh, if you are in a household where um, you are blessed that none of your household members are positive, you should already be thinking through your plans in case somebody does become positive, okay? So um, you should already have a, uh, perhaps some kind of a um, fallback in terms of who to reach out to for healthcare. Um, you may need to establish um, some kind of support system uh, from outside your home, no? Because once one person in the home becomes um, uh, or tests positive, the likelihood is that the entire home is the whole cluster of cases already. So you may need to establish contact with a relative and say that should this happen to my household, I need for you to provide me some assistance in terms of logistics maybe um, uh, ensuring that we have a proper supply of groceries and so on and so forth. You know, stuff that you need to um, um, arrange uh, from outside your home that you may not be able to take care of if you're the one who's sick or taking care of the rest of the family because you want your focus to be on that. You know? So basically endorse your logistical arrangements to a good friend or a family member. Um, so establish a healthcare link establish logistical support even as early as now no and um be ready no with supplies at home because um there's always naman a need to have uh, face shields masks gloves at the ready in your home you may want already to have at least one pulse oximeter available they're quite affordable it's very easy to order um they run uh, just on batteries it's not very difficult to learn how to use them and um, you may want to start orienting your family members about uh, the potential for quarantine and isolation if in case um, this needs to happen. You know? So being proactive about this at a time when you're not all panicking mm -hmm. will be helpful. Para pag dumating na yung crisis, nakaredy na kayo. Diba ganun din dapat yung fire planning, earthquake planning, ito COVID planning naman tayo, nakaset up na. Okay. Now, um, even as you prepare your home setting um, to anticipate this crisis, you also want to make sure that you stop COVID at your doorstep. Yun naman talaga yung goal eh, no? So yung mga lumalabas ng bahay have the extra responsibility to make sure that they don't bring COVID into their homes. So paano ba natin nakukuha yung COVID? Tandaan natin, di ba sabi natin droplets. So kung hindi tayo masipag magsuot ng face shield, hindi tayo, hindi tayo nagsusuot ng face mask na tama, we have no business being outside the home. No, I, I want to put it that way. Pagka hindi ka marunong, uh, hindi, hindi, ka, hindi mo kayang proteksyonan yung sarili mo, hindi ka dapat lumalabas ng bahay kasi ikaw ang magdadala ng sakit sa inyo. Okay? So um, kung meron tayong mga household helpers, drivers na 
uh, uh, we entrust no, with um, some of the tasks for outside the home, reorient. No? Make sure they understand. Kasi hindi lang minsan natin narinig yung mga kwentong yan, di ba? Na um, may matanda sa bahay, hindi natin pinalabas ng isang buong taon. Yung caregiver na nag-off, lumabas, bumalik, may sakit, hindi nagsabi. Tapos, ayan na, namatay na yung lolo, namatay na yung lola, kumawa na sa buong bahay. No? That's not an unusual story now. So, dapat, no, transparent din. Kailangan yung ating mga kasamahan sa bahay, tayo-tayo, no, marunong din tayong makiramdam ng simptomas natin. Kung may konting nararamdaman, wag nang matakot magsabi, mag-isolate na kaagad bago ayusin yung paraan ng pagtetest. Kasi, no, disclosing the symptoms and making sure that they're caught early is the key to prevent further spread. Okay? So, to summarize, you want to prepare your plans now before they're even needed. You want to stop COVID at your doorstep, which means the people who are leaving the house need to be extra vigilant. And if you are one of those people who are leaving the house, Aside from protecting yourself, you also have the responsibility to monitor your own health so that the earliest sign of illness, you isolate, then you arrange for testing. Everybody quarantines until those tests come back. If you're positive, everybody isolates and quarantines. The quarantine people don't have to be tested because regardless of the result, they still are quarantined for 14 days. Very well said, Doctora. Thank you very much once again for your time and for sharing your expertise with us. At this point, may I request that once again our president, Dr. Christine Pan, for the closing remarks. Many thanks again to our esteemed speaker and Grace alumna, Dr. Annalisa Ong Lim. You and other healthcare frontliners are truly God's servants of help to our people in this critical juncture of our beloved country, Philippines. And uh, for all the audience, we will be uh, discussing, arranging with Dr. Ong Lim uh, for another talk regarding vaccines. I think many of you are interested in that. The earliest notice will be via our Grace Christian College Facebook. This is actually, if you go, if you, if you do have Facebook of your, or your children or grandchildren do, uh, our Facebook is Grace Christian College. We want to take this opportunity to thank all of you, our esteemed audience, for taking time to listen. You are our Zoom guests, and it's our honor to host you. I know that aside from the Grace Christian College family, we have parents, alumni, friends of Grace, as well as the general public. Um, and I think we could just basically summarize this talk uh, from Dr. Anna Ong Lim to basically say, be prepared. And be prepared, yes, for the COVID and the COVID variants. But would I, may I just take this brief opportunity again to just share with you, COVID is a very important um, matter, which is affecting our health, our lives, our families. But also we want to be prepared also for the things which affect our eternity. Because life um, is at most maybe 70, 80, 100, 120 years old, but eternity is much, much longer. So uh, this is not intended to be scientific. So today we discussed the problem of COVID-19, COVID variants, but a problem, a greater problem is the problem of sin. Uh, in COVID, who has affected some people? But according to the Bible, sin affects every person. The Bible in Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, that's why we have the things around us in this world, litigation, um, arguing, 911, wars and conflicts. At heart, it's really because of sin in the hearts of people. With COVID, what are some symptoms? You have the fever, sore throat, et cetera. But with sin, uh, you have, uh, what you see are tears, a guilty conscience, anger, and, and such as that. Isaiah 59 says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you. With COVID, what are some results? Um, some recover, some suffer long-term or short-term effects. Sometimes, uh, sadly, there's even death. But with sin, um, the result of that is eternal death or eternal separation from God. 
Romans 6.23 in the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, what is the solution? For um, Actually, I think um, after hearing Dr. Anna Ong Lim's talk, uh, vaccines are a solution, but you can still be re, um, reinfected. So I don't know that there is a complete end all solution to that. But for sin, there is. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, paid the penalty for our sins on the cross around 2,000 years ago. And Jesus Christ paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Um, and so Jesus Christ was born. That's why we celebrate Christmas, lived the perfect life. He died on a cross. And when he died on a cross, Jesus Christ was taking the penalty for the sins of the entire world. Jesus Christ was buried in the tomb for three days. But after three days, he was resurrected. He's in heaven now. And someday Jesus Christ will come again. Uh, what, what is the payment for vaccines, COVID vaccines? Some are free, some um, have some payment, but uh, the salvation provided by Jesus Christ, it's free, freely available to all mankind. And it's our choice whether to accept or reject that free offer. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, for vaccines, how do you avail? You could register with the local governments or with barangay. Uh, but for salvation, how do we avail of that? The person needs to make the decision to trust in Jesus Christ as his or her savior from sin. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We can have all the education in the world. We can believe in many science. We can do all the good works in the world, believe in many religions, but all of that will not avail. The only way to have a relationship with God, uh, with God the Father, is through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. And so, um, so that's a decision that we all have. Uh, we were all born in sin. If we don't do anything at all, um, the, the, the black quadrant is what we will stay in. There's sin in our hearts, there's hatred, tears, and after death, there will be judgment. But if we choose Jesus Christ, if we choose to ask Jesus to be our savior, to forgive us our sins, he gives us eternal life, gives us peace, joy, love in our hearts. And after we die, we'll go to heaven. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. And so if any of you want to trust in Jesus Christ as your savior, this is a sample prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you. It is trusting in Jesus Christ alone that saves you. You can pray, dear Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Please come into my heart and forgive my sins. I now believe in Jesus Christ and trust in him alone. Thank you. Uh, as my personal savior. Thank you, dear God, for giving me eternal life and abundant life in Christ. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. So this is a sample prayer by trusting in Christ as your savior. And so um, that's how you can avail. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so um, today we are prepared for the COVID Thanks so much to Dr. Annalisa Ong Lim. And also, we also want to take this opportunity to share with you how you can prepare be for your eternity to avail of the salvations through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Uh, I think the prospect of COVID or our loved ones contracting COVID is very um, daunting and scary. But you know what? As Christians, Jesus Christ gives us his peace. Uh, the God of the Bible is the sovereign God, the God that we can trust. Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. 
Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the faller and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. He, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. And so, so praise the Lord um, for uh, providing for us a wonderful lecture by Dr. Anna Lisa Ong Lim that we can be prepared, of how to be prepared in our homes for the COVID, COVID variants. Thank you so much, Dr. Ong Lim. And we also thank the Lord for uh, bringing us all together in the promise he's given us in scripture, how it can be prepared also for eternity.